All right, is this too loud? Should I hold it farther away? Jared, do we still need to say hi to your mom? Yeah. Okay, on three. One, two, three. Hi, hi mom. mom. We will send that to my mom also. Just that part. From this point on, she's not gonna hear anything, just in case I say something stupid. <laughs> okay, I am so thankful to be given this opportunity to preach. Um, Jared and the elders have been so kind and I'm really happy to be here. We're gonna be in 2 Timothy. So you can go ahead and open your Bibles there and in a moment I'm gonna go ahead and start praying. And, but before I do that, I just wanna say one more thing about 2 Timothy while y'all are flipping there, while I'm flipping there. Um, 2 Timothy, it's written by Paul and it's to, duh, Timothy. And uh, there are a lot of great things about this book, but this is Paul's last book. He's not gonna write another book. This is the last one. And these are Paul's last words to Timothy. And so you have to take the weight of this book as being something that comes with the weight of being last words. This, these are the most important things that Paul could say to Timothy. And that's what you have to remember as you hear these words. All right, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll go ahead and get started on 2 Timothy. Lord, you've given us so much. Thank you for giving us hearts that worship you, and thank you for giving us the strength that we need. You do provide all the strength that we need to live our life, and we, are, we should be so much more thankful. Help us be more thankful for that strength, Lord. I pray that the, the strength that you give us would make us more ready for the gospel and more ready to serve the church, more ready to, to live life because of your purposes. God, give us what we need to live a godly life. Thank you that you promised that you will. Help us submit under what you called us to do and open our hearts so that we can do that exact calling. Keep us humble and make us wise, Lord. I pray this in your name, amen. All right, 2 Timothy. So I already told you it's written by Paul and that it's written to Timothy and it's his last letter. There are a bunch of other things you need to understand about this book, but you can go ahead and flip to chapter three because that's where we're gonna be. And in chapter three, we're the passage I want to talk about is in verse 14. It's 14 through 17, but we need to learn a lot about this book and what leads up to this passage before we'll understand the weight of this passage. So there are a few things about the book of 2 Timothy that you need to understand. One, when Paul is writing this book, he is in jail. And not only is he just in jail, Paul knows he's going to die. And that's why this is his last book to Timothy, and that's why these are his last words. The weight of this book should move every one of you. When Paul says the things he says in this book, he's, he's making a priority. Because he could say so many things in this book. But what he says is what he knows are the last things he can tell the church before he goes. Because he's got to leave the church in a, in a state that it could continue in. Because if he dies and the church dies with him, it's all failed. But this book is supposed to help Timothy be the person to carry on the rest of the church and to, and to do the right things and to be the man of God. And that's the way you can take this book as Paul is writing this. And these are the most important things that you could hear about ministry and about the gospel. Another thing to know about this book, when Paul writes this, he's alone. And the reason this is significant is because Paul is alone on account of his gospel witness. He was thrown in jail, and now that he's a criminal, many, many friends have just left him. And in fact, in verse, uh, sorry, uh, chapter four, verse 11, you read that the only person Luke, that, excuse me, that Paul has is Luke, the same guy who wrote the gospels. So he's got one person left. The rest of his friends have left him. And he writes to Timothy with Know, knowing the suffering that having faith brings and that the reason that his loneliness is so important is because he knows that suffering. And because he knows that suffering, he knows what it means when he tells Timothy to fan the flame, the flame of your faith. He's saying, do something that will make you suffer. 
So he's asking Timothy, literally, pursue suffering. Not primarily run after the suffering, but what you do will get you suffering, no doubt about it. And Paul's going through it. And so there's real experience and weight when Paul says those things too. Another thing you need to know is that Timothy is dealing with false teachers. And so Paul, uh, excuse me, well, Timothy was Paul's disciple. And Timothy was left in Ephesus by Paul right bef uh, before Paul wrote 1 Timothy. And in 1 Timothy, you deal with a bunch of these false teachers, but there's still a problem now. And Timothy has still got to fight them now. And so another thing to know about this book is that Timothy is dealing with the false teachers, and that'll come up big time. You should also know that Paul loves Timothy like he's a child. And, and, this, and, and if you look in the first two verses, Paul calls Timothy my beloved child at the beginning of verse 2. This language is supposed to not only indicate how much Paul cares about Timothy, but it, the language of, like a, of a father to a son is going to be really important later, and I'll point back to it. But this like familial language is really important. It happens a lot over this book. The last thing you need to understand, and what might be most important for what I'm going to be talking about today, is that Timothy is weakening under the suffering he is already enduring. And I know that might sound strange. Like, like Timothy's supposed to be the guy who was discipled by Paul. He doesn't weaken. He's just as strong as Paul, right? That's not what's happening. Timothy's weakening, and Paul knows it. And I told you before, Paul's lost a lot of friends. And if you read through this book, you'll hear him talk about he's got faithful friends who are off doing their ministry, but they're not able to help Paul while he's imprisoned. And then the friends who were with him, they left him. And so you could say there's two groups of friends, the faithful ones and the ones that have left the faith. And Paul doesn't know which one Timothy is yet. Timothy doesn't know which one he is yet. And when you read this book, read it from the point of view of a guy who, who might want to walk away from doing ministry and let the church do its own thing without him, just because he's suffering so much on account of it. Timothy needs so much help. And that's what Paul's going to give him. The other horrible part about Timothy's weakening is that Paul's going to tell him that life is about to get a lot harder. And if you look at the beginning of chapter 3, let me go and just read this first verse. He says, But understand that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Timothy's already dealing with a lot in the church and outside the church, from the culture and from the false teachers that are in the church. Paul's telling him, this is about to get so much worse. And the one reason why we know it's getting so much worse is because Paul tells him, at the end of that list, he says, avoid these people. And think about that for a sec. You're telling a pastor to avoid the godless people? Isn't he supposed to evangelize? Isn't he supposed to build people up? Even in chapter 2, Paul tells him, you need to correct people with gentleness when they're quarreling. Why? Because maybe God will use you to bring them to repentance and they'll escape from the devil's snares. But here, what does he say? Avoid them. This is a different breed of evil. And that's what Paul's talking about. In fact, these people are satanic. They belong to a satanic plot to destroy the church. And maybe you're thinking, satanic plot. That's huge. That's big. That's too far. Are you sure that these evil people are satanic? Yes, Paul makes it fairly clear in the text. Do you remember in Genesis that the fall happens, God makes the promise. He says, I'm going to bring a seed. And then you know it's that that seed is Jesus. He's the one who makes all things right. And he's going to do that even more so when he comes back. But in Genesis, we read that the next main character is Abraham. And we, we find out that the seed is going to come through Abraham. And now that we have a person, Satan begins his attack. And Satan uses one country in particular in Genesis. Maybe you remember Egypt. All over Genesis, whenever 
whenever Abraham's seed or Isaac's or Jacob's lives and, 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 and their future and their future children's lives are in danger, Egypt is always in this story. And so it's no surprise when in Exodus you find out that the people of, his, uh, of Jacob, the 12, his 12 sons and their families, they stayed in Goshen near Egypt as a part of Egypt instead of leaving. And suddenly Pharaoh's killing off all of the male children. No surprise. If they stay in enemy territory, they're going to be attacked. But do you remember the two magicians, the Egyptian magicians that were casting some sort of spells against what Moses did. So Moses turned his staff to stone, sorry, his staff to a snake. He turned the water to blood in the Nile. And do you remember that the magicians did the same thing? Well, the Bible doesn't mention their names, but uh, Jewish historians did. They kept a record of their names. Their names were Janus and Jambres. And these magicians were pawns of Satan. They were used by Satan to convince Pharaoh that Pharaoh doesn't need to listen to God because he has just the same power at his disposal with these people. They were, they were an excuse to not believe the truth. And look in verse eight of chapter three, what does he say? These evil people, he's been describing them, he says, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. This is a satanic plot. Satan couldn't destroy the seed, so now Satan's gonna destroy the church. And that's what Timothy's facing. And this is such a harsh thing to hear. Like I said, Timothy's weak. He feels like, like he can't stand up anymore, like he can't do this. In the second chapter, verse three, Paul says, share in sufferings. sufferings. It, he's it seems like Paul's indicating that Timothy wasn't already sharing in sufferings. And in the first chapter, he says, you have to fan the flame and not be afraid, which makes us think that Timothy was afraid. And so when you, when you get all of this piling up, Timothy's already weak, he doesn't want to be there, and suddenly Paul's like, it's bad now, you hate it, it's gonna get worse. And like, you, it's so discouraging. Timothy had to have been so discouraged, he must have been feeling so hopeless. And I hope you, you feel and see that he would have been feeling that bad because you need to step into his shoes when you read this because Paul is about to give the best hope he could ever give Timothy. So let's read verse 14 through 17 of chapter 3. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul says right there, the scriptures contain everything you need to fight back against this evil culture and this false teacher evil culture plot of satan to destroy the church everything you need is right here stay in the scriptures so let's go ahead and walk through this text and we're going to talk about what timothy needs to do and something you have to understand is that as paul's dying he's saying i'm handing the torch off to timothy timothy's got to do the rest He's got to lead the church. He's got to be faithful. Paul was faithful. Now Timothy's got to take care. And in the same way that Paul is telling this to Timothy, you have this calling. And so when you read these things, know that just because this was written nearly 2,000 years ago doesn't mean that there aren't plots anymore. doesn't mean there aren't evil people. And you might be one of the younger pieces of the generation in our church, but that doesn't mean that you aren't being given the torch to and you are called to take it up and to protect the faith and to be faithful to serve the church and to bring it through Satan's attacks. So feel the weight of this and feel Timothy's anxiety and be ready to be encouraged by what Paul has to say. So let's go ahead and start breaking this down. Verse 14, he says, but as for you, and so let me give a little bit of context. He was talking, saying these people are deceived. And he says, but as for you, Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. 
And so I think the first question is, well, what has Timothy learned? That's what we need to continue in. If we're going to fight against Satan's plot to destroy the church the, and, and keep the faith, we need to continue in, what, in the same thing that Timothy learned. Timothy, what Paul's referring to is the gospel. When he says what you have learned, it's because Timothy throughout his whole life had been grown up with faith and with the gospel. But most of, most of your Bibles, I assume, have the word continue. That word, it's not a bad word, not the best word that could have translated uh, from, from the Greek that could have been translated. A better word is remain. So read it like this. But as for you, remain in what you have learned and have firmly believed. And so with this idea of remain, it's like you've already got it, and that's the gospel. He's already, he already knows it. But what he has to do is not abandon it. And here you kind of start to see how this Janus and Jambres lies are just like their lies start to fold, come together. Because Janus and Jambres with Pharaoh, they were saying, hey, you see this? This is proof that you don't need to listen to God. Believe in this. And here's what the evil culture is doing. They're saying, hey, you don't need to believe in God. You can just believe in this. You don't have to listen to what God has to say. You don't have to listen to the gospel. You don't have to listen to the scriptures. See, we got, we got this right here. That's what they're saying. And let me read part of verse 5, and you'll, maybe you'll start to see this, because you remember from Romans that the gospel is the power of God. These evil, this evil culture, these false teachers, they have the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. So this is what they do. They feed lies, and Timothy has to sweep away the lies, and he needs to remain in what he has learned, which is the gospel. And Paul gives two ways of how he remains. Here's the first. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing whom you learned it from. Excuse me. Knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation. So the first thing he has to do is he has to remain knowing who he learned it from. In the first chapter, I think it's verse, verse 5, Paul talks about Timothy's mother and his grandmother. And you remember me mentioning how important it is that Timothy, or that Paul called Timothy a child, his child? That father-son relationship language? That uh, the pointing out Timothy's legacy of faith with his grandmother and then his mother and now given to him and Paul's come in on it. What Paul's trying to say is your whole life has been surrounded by you being prepared for this moment. God has spent Timothy's whole life giving him the gospel, helping him have it by giving him people to have it to, excuse me, by giving him the people who would teach it to him. And the encouragement is that Timothy can remain in the gospel, not only because God has sovereignly been working in his life. Yes, that's a big piece of hope. But Timothy has got to realize, and Timothy has realized, that the only reason that his mother and his grandmother and Paul and anyone else that had a, a good influence on his life, the only reason that those people were able to teach him and were able to remain in the gospel themselves is because God was faithful with them and helped them. And it, was, and it was the gospel's effect in their life, even as they felt weak, that was keeping them faithful. And so now Timothy realizes, oh, I have to remain in the gospel knowing that everyone before me has had to do the exact same thing. Now it's my turn. And that's what Paul's saying. And here's the second thing. So Paul mentions the legacy. That's number one. Timothy has a legacy of faith to draw on and a legacy of people to see how God has been working. Number two, the scriptures. The second part, verse 15, and how from childhood you, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. The scriptures, Paul is saying that the scriptures hold the source of the gospel, or the source of the power of the gospel. And so what he's saying is, you need the gospel, you need to hold on to it, and if you hold on to the scriptures, you will have the gospel. Because there are lies out there. And, and, and maybe Timothy's thinking, what if I pick the wrong one? What if there's all these lies, and what if I'm, not, what if I'm on the wrong path right now? 
And Paul says, no, come back to the scriptures. You remain in the gospel by staying in the scriptures. Why? Because they're able to make you wise for salvation. And this is why this is so important. Timothy is already saved. And so when we're talking about him being wise for salvation, yes, we're talking about initial salvation, you know, justification by faith, yes. But salvation is also when God is working to make you holy. And salvation is also when Jesus comes back and you are glorified. And what Paul is saying is that the same gospel that gave you faith in the first place is going to keep you steady, keep you faithful in the faith now. And that's the thing that you have to realize is that the gospel is the only way that you will be faithful. Not only is it how you got saved, it's how you stay within God's plan for you. And that's what Timothy is hearing, and that's what Timothy needs to learn. And then Paul gives two, well, he gives some evidences. I don't know if I'll say two. He gives a lot of evidences. We're going to start on, on verse 16. We're going to talk about why the scriptures are so powerful as they contain the gospel. Because a question y'all should ask yourselves is, why isn't the gospel just as powerful when somebody t like just talks about gospel stuff? Why isn't the gospel... Well, it's not that it's not as powerful, but why is why do you need the scriptures when you could just keep reminding people? You could just tell them about the gospel, mention like, hey, Jesus is awesome. You should uh, believe in him. But there's something else that Paul's getting to. It's like, no, you have to be in the scripture. You have to use the scripture. You can't just talk about godly things. You need to talk about the scriptures. And this is why we preach the word. And that's what Paul gets to in 2 Timothy 4. He says, preach the word. But this part and verse 16 explains and, and shows why the scriptures are so valuable. Let's read it. All of scripture is breathed out by God. Let's just stop there. Y'all probably already know about the doctrine of inspiration. It's that God is the one who created the scriptures, that they come from him, and therefore they have a power and that, and that they are inspired. And that is what Paul's talking about. But it's so much more than just that God came up with the scriptures and that they're from him. The word breathed is kind of interesting. Maybe some of your translations don't have it, but in the Greek, this is the best English translation uh, from the Greek, and it's that it's God breathed. That's the best way to say it probably. It's God breathed. The scriptures are God breathed. And you must be asking, what is up with God breathed? Why is that important? When's the last time you can remember God breathing and something happening. Probably thinking back, creation. If you look in Genesis 2, Genesis 2 verse 7, here's what it says. Then the Lord God formed the man out of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So here's what happens in Genesis 2. God breathes on some dirt, and it becomes a human. Like, that's insane. And Paul is taking that language and he's placing it here and he says, God breathed that same life into the scriptures. And so now you, what Timothy knows, now what you know is, oh, the same power that literally brings Adam to life is the same power that rests in this book. The scriptures are so powerful. They're as powerful as God's creative acts. That's what, Tim, that's what Paul is getting at when he says that they are God-breathed. This is probably one of the most amazing descriptions of Scripture in the Bible, and I wouldn't expect anyone to ever top it outside of the Bible. This is amazing. The Scriptures have power. They have power to communicate the Gospel. They have power to never fail. And that's so important because Timothy is up against us, the prediction of a satanic plot to destroy the church. And now Paul's saying, I'm going to die. It's your responsibility to be faithful now. I can't do the work anymore. You have to do it. And Paul just told him that the scriptures are so powerful, they can't fail. All he has to do, hold on to the scriptures. By holding on to the scriptures, you hold on to the gospel. By holding on to the gospel, you won't abandon the truth. And if you don't abandon the truth, you will be faithful. And if you're faithful then the church will go on. And so this is the only piece of hope that could change Timothy's perspective on the 
coming suffering on the on the hopelessness of fail of the of the likelihood of failure timothy already feels like he's a failure because he's so weak and now paul's saying just come back stay here stay in the scriptures and this is the same exact calling that each one of you have in the same way that timothy has a legacy of faith each one of you have a legacy of faith Maybe it's your parents, maybe it's faithful teachers here in the church, maybe it's a good friend, but you have people who have been faithful and because of that, you know the gospel. And there are some of you probably who don't have a legacy of faith in your family or don't have a legacy of faith in your, in your friendships because either you're new, new to the gospel or this person that was once sharing the gospel with you now doesn't even walk with the Lord. They've become faithless. Even if you don't see in your current relationships your legacy of faith, every one of us has a spiritual ancestry that dates back to the beginning. Janice and Jambres, they stood up to Moses. And what Timothy can say, along with Paul and his grandmother, and what you can say, along with all the people who have had an influence in your life, is that if, if if Moses can stand against Satan by combating the lies of Janus and Jambres, then I can too. And if King David, if he can stand against Satan's plot to destroy Israel and combat the Philistines, then I can too. And if Elijah, if Elijah can stand against Satan's plot to corrupt all of Israel through Jezebel and the worship of Baal, and if he can stand up to her lies and her murderous rampages, then I can too. And if Jesus was so faithful that he bought me a spot in the kingdom with his blood, then I can be faithful too. And if the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me, then I can be faithful too. And that's how the disciples were faithful, looking back on a legacy of faith. And that's how Timothy is going to be faithful. And you have that legacy. Each one of you do, and you have the opportunity to stand up, to take responsibility, and to be, be the person that ushers the church in past Satan's plots. You could be the person, all of you, together, that God has called us to protect each other from Satan and his plots, protect each other from our own flesh and sin, and by staying with the gospel, by staying in the word, you accomplish that. This is the only encouragement that we need, and it is so important, and Timothy needs it so much, and we need it. And so, this is where Timothy's left off. In the next chapter, Paul says, I'm gonna die. And in a famous verse that most of you probably already know, Paul says, I have fought the fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And he doesn't say these words right here, but it's, it's just screamed all over this book. Timothy, you have to do all of that now. You have to take it up. And just like Timothy had to took it up and he passed it on and he faithfully passed it on to other men and women, it's now come down the line and 2000 years later, you're alive, you're here, and it's your job to be faithful. It's time to step up and that's what each one of us are called to do. Let's pray. Lord, you do give us a high calling and it is so scary, it is so dangerous, it's so, it's full of so much self-denial and it's full of, it is full of suffering. Thank you for your son and thank you for his work. Thank you for the life-giving power that the Bible has. Keep us in your word, Lord. Keep us attached to the gospel and don't let us fall away and find truth where there is no truth. Don't let us be deceived. Thank you that you've promised to keep every single one of us and I pray that we would be a part of your keeping each other and that we would keep each other accountable. We would not let anyone be faithless. We would bring everyone back to the flock. I pray all this in your name. Amen.